the Joe Rogan experience. Now, now measuring it in humans is, I mean, there's this concept of people, I'm an emotional person, mm -hmm. you know, I'm emotional. Like, people, I get emotional. Like, people love to say yeah. those, those kind of right. things. What, uh, is it possible to measure varying degrees of emotional response in terms of, like, how it's affecting a person physiologically, whether or not these emotional responses are physiological, or whether you've gone down a well-grooved psychological path that you've been sort of participating in your whole life so right. that you have these right. uh, sort of triggers. This happens, and then, up, oh, I'm going to... I'm going to start crying. This happens. Up, oh, I'm going to get angry. And people sort of fall into those paths without self-reflection, without this ability to be objective and introspective and go, why am I reacting this way? Mm -hmm. Like what? Maybe you should stop being so emotional, Joe. Right? Has anybody ever said that to you? <laughs> uh, I guess my oh, sure. wife has said. <laughs> sure. Well, what does that mean? Like yeah. what, what? You know so, what I mean? Like the, this – the varying degrees of emotional right. response and whether or not those are beneficial or whether or not they d detract from your experience right. or inhibit your your ability to be productive. So, you know, I, you really nailed a lot of interesting stuff in there. And, I, um, you know, it's a very kind of deep analysis of, of what's going on. So the problem is that our language is so bad that um, – all these terms that we have, we borrow from what's called folk wisdom or folk psychology. You know, they've, they've come through the ages. And this is true in every aspect of science, that you have folk terms, you know, folk physics becomes real physics and then the folk stuff goes away. Folk biology becomes real biology and the, you know, the, the folk stuff goes away. But in psychology, the folk stuff never goes away because we always experience the folk aspect of it when we have a conscious experience. That's what our conscious minds is, our folk psychology of ourselves and of others and of other animals. But the um, um, underneath that is the part that we can get rid of the folk psychology of because we can understand how behavior is controlled, how these physiological responses are controlled. And it ain't because, you know, we've had fears causing it, you know, but, but when you're afraid, you're almost always running from the bear and feeling fear. But, and, and so you assume that when you're running from the bear, fear is what causes you to run. But fear is not the answer. Fear is your awareness that all that shit is happening to you. Mm. But also the the ability to contemplate the consequences, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, this bear's going to get me, he's going to eat me! Yeah. And so it's all, fear. that's all, you know, one interpretation after another running forward. But no self, no fear, that's n no possible either, right? Well, it, no, I mean, you need the self to be afraid. Yeah. So, I mean, that's your, and to be consciously afraid. But you can react to danger without the self. And that's what, you know, that's key. You, you find yourself freezing or you're walking in New York City and you jump back and the bus goes flying by. So you've reacted to danger, but, but only afterwards do you feel fear when you cognitively become aware that that's happened. Well, in that sort of a situation, but in a situation like where you're walking down a dark alley and then you see some guy who seems to be following you. Yeah. You're like, oh boy. Yeah. So now you're, you're in a situation where you're in a potentially dangerous situation. Right. So now you're anxious about what's going to happen. So yeah. you're not starting with fear, you're starting with anxiety. Worry about what's going to happen. Nothing, there's nothing there that's made you... But then what if he ramps it up? It says, uh, hey, Joe, yeah. why don't you come over here, man? Right. I'd like to borrow some money from you. Yeah. You're like, oh, shit. Now so, it's fear? Is that fear? Now you've got a, a specific threat. And right. yeah, so you, now you're into fear, and then that's going to morph into another anxiety about what the hell is this guy going to do to me. Right. So, but all of that, you know, the, the, the dark alleyway is going to go into your brain and trigger your muscle tension, your heart to race, and so forth. And the dark alley is going to go to your cortex, and you're going to be interpreting the fact that you're in a dark alley and your heart is racing in terms of being anxious and fearful and all of that. But they're happening separately. It's not one bundle. It's mm. like separate things in the brain. And once we understand that, it becomes, I think, a much easier problem how to 
approach problems of fear and anxiety. You've got to separately treat the behavior and the physiology from the conscious thoughts. And in between those two, you've also got to change the cognitions that underlie uh, the, the conscious experience, but also the cognitions can trigger behavior. So, you know, one of the things we've, uh, we've proposed, uh, I, I proposed this in my last book, uh, Anxious, was a kind of test program for exploring this, where uh, it would be kind of a three-part, uh, three-step program. Um, first, you would, um, you'd have to do it with something simple like a spider phobic. A what? A spider phobic or a snake phobic. Oh, okay. So oh, you yeah. would do exposure therapy subliminally. That means you Subliminally? You'd present the picture of a snake or the spider so fast that the conscious mind doesn't know it's there. So like those old uh, hungry eat popcorn things? Yeah, exactly. Have yeah, the movies? Right, okay. right, yeah. And that's a very common technique in psychology. So too. they would show you a film and there'd be a, one or two frames of a spider if you had a rack Or just a picture, you know, okay. or, but it could be a film, yeah. Okay. And, uh, it, but it would have to go very fast in the film. So, it would, it, so with a picture, you'd just present it re really quickly. And because, um, you know, normally if you show a spider phobic, uh, try to do exposure therapy, they don't want to do it because they don't want to deal with spiders. Mm. But they, they, their conscious mind doesn't know it's happening because it's going through subliminally. So the amygdala is being tamed by the exposure. And now they can look at the picture without, you know, the body re reacting. They're not jumping. They're not, uh, their heart isn't racing because the amygdala has been turned off. So all of those body responses have, have calmed down. So now the person can kind of go some, undergo some cognitive change about looking at spiders and so forth. And then finally, once you've done those two steps, the brain's ready for talk therapy and meditation and other kinds of mindfulness approaches. Uh, because all of the, the impediments to all that have been put aside by this, these first two steps. So has anybody ever like officially cured someone of arachnophobia or phidiophobia or you know fear of snakes or spiders like those are those seem to be almost like deep-seated genetic fears well that we i mean our ancestors yes had uh, snake and but they vary right. which is what's weird the, the, our I ancestors mean, certainly experienced v venomous snakes right. and but there's something about some people have of almost illogical reaction right. to it that it's often been speculated that this is some sort of a genetic memory of someone perhaps in their ancestry line surviving a snake attack or losing mm. someone to a snake. It's more, you know, it turns out that the, uh, it's more about the ability to rapidly learn about those kinds of dangers than to innately respond. Mm. So there seems to be, it's called prepared learning. So you have an evolutionarily based thing that's with you that everyone has some version of, but you know, it varies from individual to individual. And then some people <clears throat> um, are prone to rapidly learn that, either because of other experiences or because of their part particular genetic makeup. And so they tend to go down the road of, of acquiring these kinds of phobias. Now, so it's the, the problem with treating that by just extinguishing it uh, through exposure is that the um, uh, extinction is always impermanent. You know, if you, once you've been reduced, nothing is wrong. This is true in a rat or a person. Let's say the rat has been given a tone that's been paired with a shock, and then it hears the tone 20 or 30 times, it stops responding. But then if it goes back in the, the room or the chamber where the shock had occurred, the tone will again bring it, you know, elicit it, and the spider phobic returns to the place where he or she was bitten by a spider or a place where spiders are supposed to be present, it can come back. So these are imperfect temporary solutions. They're not enough. Um, and uh, that's why, I mean, they're called, uh, these are called, you know, reinstatement and um, uh, things like that because they, they pop back up. So maybe medications can help tamp that down a bit. So. Uh, medications are useful in, in that sense of being able to control the behavior and the physiology, but less so in terms of changing the mental state. Because, you know, how could you possibly design a medication that would know how to change the content of a, a mental state? 
mean, that seems like an impossible task. Mm. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to change all mental states. Right. You want to change the one content. You know, I'm afraid of spiders. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's so fascinating, though, how people vary so widely in their, their reaction to certain fears or to certain things that could induce fear whether it's dogs or you know whatever irrational thing that people yeah. have the the source of that is v really often speculated that there's like some sort of a genetic component to mm -hmm. it do you buy into that so let's say let's say uh, that you know in any kind of situation like that there are multiple systems in the brain that are going to mm. be involved we're going to isolate the amygdala as you know hypothetical part of that system that is detecting and responding to the stimulus. So we're going to go into the amygdala and focus on one little part of it uh, called the lateral nucleus. That doesn't matter, but it's the part that gets the input from the outside world. So that is the gateway into the amygdala. So now let's talk about, let's say it's got, I don't know, 100,000 cells and neurons. Um, and um, each of those neurons is going to have a bell curve that's based on the genes that made that cell and whatever kinds of electrical signals it's had throughout the life of the organism. So you're going to have 100,000 bell curves of you know, various degrees that when the stimulus comes in, those cells that that are activated, their little bell curves are going to determine how much they respond to that. And that's going to propagate to other cells that have their own bell curves in areas and so on down the line that what happens at the level of behavior is a very complicated uh, kind of summation of all those bell curves of all those cells that happen to be activated. So it's not like you know one thing is programmed. It's not like a brain area is programmed. It's all about what's happened at those specific cells, both through genetics and experience. So we often kind of oversimplify things by thinking, well, there's a, a gene or a, an area that has um, inherited that thing. <laughs>